you would remain standing for the reading of the Word of God today. This comes out of the Gospel of Matthew, which we'll be in for the next few weeks, and it'll chapter 10, verse 40 through 42. So hear now the Word of God. Those who receive you are also receiving me, and those who receive me are also receiving the one who sent me. Those who receive a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Those who receive a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. I assure you that everyone who gives even a cup of cold water to the little ones, because they are my disciples, will certainly be rewarded. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, may these spoken words be faithful to the written word and lead us to the living word, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So last month we talked about how God calls us all and that God, last week, mentioned that God calls all of us to be disciples of Jesus Christ. But what does that look like? What does... Jesus tell us to do. Lucky for us, the Revised Common Lectionary gives us, during the month of July, using the Gospel of Matthew, some stories of Jesus' thoughts on how we are to be a disciple. Discipleship sounds like it's supposed to be easy. It sounds like it's just straightforward. Just follow what Jesus says. But the reality is, and truly this is true for anything, to be good at it, or or even to be great at it, it takes dedication and a whole lot of work. If we're going to walk the path of discipleship as followers of Jesus Christ, we have to take Jesus' words seriously when he says in Matthew 7, near the end of the Sermon on the Mount, go in through the narrow gate. The gate that leads to destruction is broad and the road wide, so many people enter through it. But the gate that leads to life is narrow. And the road difficult, so few people find it. The Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And it's the largest section of Jesus' teaching in Matthew. By the time we get to the 10th chapter, we're entering really the second largest teaching of Jesus. In the 10th chapter, in the beginning, Jesus is sending out the disciples on a mission trip. It says this in verse 1, he called his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to throw them out and to heal every kind of disease and every sickness. This is Jesus' kind of test run with the disciples. He's sending them out, not to the world, but only to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. He is sending out these Jews to tell the good news among the people they know, fellow Jews. He gives them instructions on what to say and what to do as they go out to their own people. Starting in verse 7, he says, as you, make, as you go, make this announcement. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, drive out demons. Piece of cake work, right? Then he warns them and says uh, what will happen during their experience. In verse 16, it says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, so therefore be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. It's going to be rough out there for them. People will persecute you, making fun, make fun of you, flog you, imprison you, and claim that you are preaching blasphemy. This is just a great job description, isn't it? I mean, who, who would say yes to this? I mean, can you imagine me telling us as disciples, what I want you to do is go out, you know, the... Go out to Salisbury, the people you know, who you're comfortable with. Tell them the good news that the kingdom of heaven has come near. That part, fine. They won't like you, though, and they'll reject you. But you are doing this in the name of God, so it'll all be okay. If I gave you those instructions and you left, you'd probably be feeling exactly what the disciples are feeling like in this moment as Jesus sends them out to do just this work. Now I say all this to put it in perspective what Jesus says in these three short verses that we get today. It's in these three verses that Jesus talks about how these disciples should be welcomed by those who they come in contact with. As the readers and the listeners of this private conversation, it can be hard to glean much from this short text in the lectionary. Yet we do get an image of what hospitality should look like. 
A unique piece of hospitality happened around us this week. Not to us, thank you Jesus, but around us. Boxes and boxes and more boxes filled my Facebook feed on Tuesday. Because Tuesday was the, origin, is the official moving day of the Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. If you're not familiar with what that is, that's when, what this means is pastors and their families, they shuffle around to new appointments last Tuesday. Those moving out of a parsonage are supposed to be out by noon, and the new pastoral family is supposed to arrive and start unpacking at three in the afternoon. Just three quick hours to turn around, and it happens in a blur. And it doesn't, it doesn't leave a lot of time for a parsonage committee to fix anything along the way either, but this is really how, if you're going to move a bunch of people, how it just needs to be done. And it's something unique for us pastors in the United Methodist Churches. It's unique because the first time many of us meet laity, those who will be ministering to and with for however many years to come, is in the middle of a hot June sun in front of your new house. You have to start these first conversations, trying to remember people's names while they pick up your box of high school yearbooks or carefully place your wedding china on the floor in the dining room. I can't think of anywhere where this kind of unique interaction happens. You have a sea of new faces all looking at you, their new pastor, and they're trying to size you up and figure you out all while carrying your stuff inside the new house, silently judging every box they carry. It's an awkward kind of moment, to say the least. What's also interesting is how people introduce themselves for the very first time. One gentleman that came to me during my first walkthrough of a new church sanctuary shook my hand and said, said his name and then said, I'm the oldest rat in the barn. Now, what are you supposed to do with that? I mean, it can mean a couple of different things. Does this mean that he's simply one of the oldest members and he's used to saying country phrases? Does this mean the church is truly full of rats and he's the leader who's going to try to just run you out in about two weeks? How do you take that statement? What do you do with it? I tend to just be friendly in those moments hear the advi- and hear the advice of the penguins from the movie Madagascar, just smile and wave, boys, smile and wave and then move on to the next person. But first impressions, they can tell you a lot about a person. During one move day, way back when in 2007, I met a guy who I'm just gonna call Bill. He met the moving truck at the Parsonage, was eager to help move everything in, and he came up to me and shook my hand and introduced himself, and as he kind of left with one box, another parishioner laughed and said, don't worry about him, he's no good. He'll probably be on his phone the whole time. And as we unpacked the truck, sure enough, Bill received probably about three phone calls and and spent most of the time in the backyard on those conversations as we were drenched with sweat unloading the truck. Sometimes first impressions, they leave you wondering what to think about a person, and other times you realize quickly what you see is what you're going to get. I was attending a district meeting, and someone said, I have never met a church that doesn't think it's friendly. I'm sure we all think that is true. All congregations think they are a friendly church. On some level, they are. But friendly, that's easy. You can offer smiles and a handshake. You can greet people and say hello. Friendly is easy. What is hard and is a call that Jesus is giving us today as a disciple is being welcoming and showing hospitality. In this passage, Jesus is not talking about being friendly. The Greek word that Matthew uses here means much more than that. It is dakomai. And what this word means is to receive, to take with a hand, to grant access to, to receive hospitality, not to refuse friendship or to receive favorably. Many different English translations of the Bible use the word welcome in this, in this verse. Uh, some use receive, like the common English Bible that I read today, or they use the word accept. But no matter how you translate it, this word moves way beyond just being friendly. To be welcoming means that we are to be open to a visitor, a new arrival. And sometimes we are excited to do this. 
When a new baby enters the family, whether your own or a grandchild or great-grandchild, we greet that new human with open arms and we, are, and we get ourselves ready for this dramatic change in everyone's life. This new child means life isn't the same and it is wonderful and it is beautiful. You love this new life and you settle in, although your life has changed almost in every single way. There's a story of a, a single man who moved to a new city to start a new job after he graduated from college. He was one of those rare exceptions who kept practicing his faith in college and attending church, and he wanted to continue that as he started this new chapter in his life. He visited a few congregations that were around his neighborhood, and after about three weeks of this church shopping, he was starting to feel a little uncomfortable, and he noticed a trend within these different congregations. He would arrive for worship, and he was always greeted at someone, by someone at the front door, and they would make small talk and welcome him to the worship service. But then during the service, a few people would say hi, but others would just kind of shoot him dirty looks. There were young families who would give him, uh, give him the once-over as well, sh- shielding their kids during the time of the passing of the peace. By the third week, in different churches, he felt like he needed to be walking in with a sign around his neck saying, yes. I am a single man in my 20s. I am not here for your children. I am here to worship God. In verse 42 that I read, Jesus teaches, I assure you that everyone who gives even a cup of water to the little ones, because they are my disciples, will certainly be rewarded. As we hear this, we need to know the phrase little ones here does not mean children. As Douglas Hare writes in a commentary on Matthew, the term little ones is not about children. It refers to humble Christians who are not church leaders and and who may also be poor. Such persons must must not be neglected, sorry. Such persons must not be neglected or treated with disdain because they too represent the Christ. When we offer, even the simplest thing like glass of water or a cup of coffee or a sausage biscuit to someone. We are offering it to someone who represents Christ, a spark of the divine image. Anytime we look at a new person who comes, we have to admit that maybe we look at them with a little bit of suspicion, wondering who they are. People judge them by the clothes they wear, the car they drive, or how they carry themselves. I remember one family who came to visit one of my churches I served, not this one, excited to see a young family with two small girls. At the end of worship, the congregation was just buzzing about this family, and one of them came up and said, do you know the husband? He's a doctor. A doctor. Everyone was so excited when they joined too, and you all are church people, so you know what they were thinking. Cha-ching. But what church wouldn't be excited to welcome a young doctor's family? However, is is that the same welcome that Jesus tells us to give to everyone? Would we give the same excitement to a family who has a blue-collar job, or a single mother of three, or a single man in his mid-20s? Verse 41, I think, is the key to understanding this section of the Scripture. Jesus' teaching says, those who receive a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Those who receive a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Notice what's happening here. Those who receive a prophet as a prophet. Those who receive a righteous person as a righteous person. Jesus talked about welcoming those in front of us as who they are, not who we want them to be. We're to welcome a single mom just as a single mom. We're to welcome a doctor just as a doctor. Adam as Adam, Jill as in Jill. Welcoming is the ability to let someone into our circle and allowing that circle to change, getting a little bit wider and allowing them to be who God has created me to be, even if it demands change within us. This is when discipleship gets hard. To embody this type of welcoming is to be willing to accept change. It is welcoming in a stranger in order for their story to slowly become part of our story. The churches that gave bad looks to a young single man missed out on an opportunity to have a dedicated disciple within their midst. 
Jesus says, anyone who welcomes you, welcomes me. Are we practicing that type of welcoming that Jesus is talking about here? The type that opens up, us up to being transformed by the people that we embrace our lives around. When we see a single mother of three or a young man seeking a closer walk with God, or people who don't look like us, think like us, or act like us, and we truly welcome them into this family of faith, we are encountering God. When we move beyond just friendly greetings and welcome them into every aspect of what it means to be part of this faith community, we welcome Jesus into our lives. And that is being a disciple. That is a disciple who is able to say, with all honesty and truth, you're welcomed. And all God's people said, Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you continue to move in us and through us. May we be willing to welcome new people into our circle, into this family of faith, into this community, into our own hearts. May we will be willing to be changed by those interactions so their story becomes part of our story. May we widen our circles so that we can encounter you in real and tangible ways. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.